if you listen deep in your melon heart. That's what the real instructions are. My melon wants to punch my dad in the face and steal his arm. <laughs> well, those things are bad, so they can't be the real instructions. But you keep listening. Just remember, listen to your melon heart. Ah, what was that? I just thought about my anxieties, and it's like my mind hand touched a hot memory stove. Interesting. Oh, hey, what are your thoughts on melon hearts? I don't know what you're talking about. Hey there, I'm Ketchup, and this is Melon Heart, a podcast about how it feels to be alive on a crumbling world at this terrifying crossroads of hope and despair, of possibility and empathy versus doom and hatred. It's also about the most fascinating, underrated, and I believe crucial body of ideas on the planet, anarchism. I'll interview guests about their experiences as, realistically, a privileged few living under a hostile planetary regime that uses our relative comfort and complacency under capitalism as a weapon to keep the entire world on lockdown. Then I'll use these conversations as springboards to delve into the philosophy of what it would mean to be truly free. Anarchism is a peace movement. I mean that in the very simple sense that it's about people treating each other right without being forced to. That's peace. Obviously, there's fighting involved, too. I'm just not convinced that the things that make us strong in the face of adversity are always the things that make us good to one another, or that being ready for war makes you ready for peace. Maybe that just comes back to making sure that your vision of victory is really worth dying for. Today's guest is my dearest friend, Harry Michalide. Thanks for listening. This interview took place in April 2017, so after Trump was elected, but before all the hurricanes. So, Harry, first tell me just briefly about your life and how you spend your time in a kind of general way so people can get a sense for who you are. Yeah, sure. So, my name's Harry Michalide. I grew up in a rural town, Litchfield, Maine. Um, I cavorted with the bugs and the trees and uh, played in, in, in the brooks, you know, ran around through snow, snowballs with my friends. Uh, I also watched plenty of TV, like I feel like most people our generation went on the internet a bunch. Parents got internet when I was 11. Um, these days I'm at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I'm in a physics program and I work in a... Um, uh, well, I work in a lab, which is under the physics department, but it's really more of an ecology lab, studying uh, the ecology of microbes, you know, little single-celled uh, doodads swimming around and such. So I go during the lab during the day, and then after that, I try to play music and, um, you know, bring about ecological anarchist revolution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got this campaign, uh, STEM Strikes the War Machine, and, um, yeah, you know, try to hang out and joke around and be silly with my friends. What, um, strikes the war machine? Is that... Yeah, yeah. Um, you hesitate because I used to call it stem boycotts the war machine. Right. But I've come to realize it's really more of a strike than a boycott is what I'm going for. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is, uh, the ultimate goal is to have a large percentage of the money which is spent on research and design of weapons and equipment for the military and have it be given uh, directly to scientists uh, and, and tech technologists, engineers, mathematicians, STEM field folk to decide for themselves what would be the best use of that money. <coughs> yes. Okay. And I know that you also um, took a little time and went to the... Uh, no dapple encampment at Standing Rock. Do you want to talk a little about that experience? Sure. Uh, yeah, I was at the Standing Rock Resistance Camp for three days. Um, this was in the uh, end of November, just a few days before Thanksgiving. And uh, I was there on the night of the water cannons, like right before Thanksgiving. I stayed just out of the radius of the water cannons, but I breathed a whole lot of tear gas, uh, so I know what it feels like to be drowning on land. Um, 
and I mean that was the uh, that was the most I mean that was a highlight for sure. It was weird actually. Like I thought it would be scarier, but somehow it was just there's a thrill of putting my body exactly where I felt it needed to be. Um, the camp itself uh, is it was really quite impressive how everyone was able to be like um, given medical care and there was regular food available. Um, uh, as far as I could tell, it seemed like most people really came there with a willingness to uh, follow indigenous leadership and be as useful as they could um, for the most part and uh, it had a profound effect on me. Yeah, you mentioned earlier how there was sort of an implicit hierarchy going on, and then we'd gotten to the cafe, and I was tying up my dog. We started talking yeah. about other things, but um, you want to go back to that uh, line of thinking? I just want to clarify here that when I used the phrase implicit hierarchy, it wasn't meant as a dig. I am an anarchist, but I do believe that there are situations where hierarchy can be valid, like between a parent and a child, or a teacher and a student. For me, the moment when any hierarchy's validity would really come into question is the moment when it starts requiring the use of force to maintain, like when a parent hits their child and then their child gets taken away. So I think I was really impressed with how uh, able this place was to function. Um, and so, you know, I wonder how how can a spontaneous gathering of an ever rotating group of people uh, manage to like simultaneously wage um, a pretty effective, ultimately not well, who knows where we're, where we're at, but a campaign against a pipeline and feed everyone and keep everyone warm and provide medical care and emotional care um, and keep the fires going. How is this all able to work? Um, ultimately, I don't know, but I have theories. <laughs> <laughs> One theory is that, like, there is this understanding as you go there and sort of a shared cultural understanding that indigenous leadership is to be followed. So, you know, if it comes down to a decision, you say, what, you know, if, if you can't quite figure out what to do, then, you know, you end up going with, well, what does the nearest indigenous person think about this? And if there's still a split, then, okay, what does... Uh, the elder, uh, the nearest elder in the situation, believe we should do in the situation. So it's not a hierarchy in the sense that, like, someone's going to shoot you if you disobey. <laughs> um, but there is, like, just sort of a general cultural thrust of obeying indigenous leadership, which I feel lended enough structure to keep this place uh, going and functioning and, like, dis dis all the decisions that need to be made, uh, made. As I alluded to earlier, this point Harry makes that no one will put a gun to their head if they disobey is not insignificant. In fact, for many, if not most, if not all anarchists, the primary offense of the state is its monopoly on physical violence, its monopoly of force. So I'm going to read an excerpt from Anarchy Works by Peter Gelderloos that is actually about how the Sioux would fight in the past without the use of coercion among their own people. In a two-year war, thousands of warriors from the Lakota and Cheyenne nations defeated the U.S. military and destroyed several army forts during what became known as Red Cloud's War. During the war, the Lakota and Cheyenne organized without coercion or military discipline, but contrary to the typical dichotomies, their relative lack of hierarchy did not hamper their ability for organization. On the contrary, they held together during a brutal war on the basis of a collective self-motivated discipline and varying forms of organization. In a Western army, the most important unit is the military police or the officer who walks behind the troops, pistol loaded and ready to shoot anyone who turns and runs. The Lakota and Cheyenne had no need for discipline imposed from above. They were fighting to defend their land and way of life in groups bound by kinship and affinity. Some fighting groups were structured with a chain of command, while others operated in a more collective fashion. But all of them voluntarily rallied around individuals with the best organizational abilities, spiritual power, and combat experience. These war chiefs did not control those who followed them so much as inspire them. When morale was low or a fight looked hopeless, 
groups of warriors often went home, and they were always free to do so. If a chief declared war, he had to go, but no one else did. So a leader who could not convince anyone to follow him to war was engaging in an embarrassing and even suicidal venture. In contrast, politicians and generals in Western society frequently start unpopular wars, and they are never the ones to suffer the consequences. Despite being impossibly outnumbered by the U.S. military and white settler paramilitaries, the Native Americans won. After Red Cloud's war, the Lakota and Cheyenne enjoyed nearly a decade of autonomy and peace. Contrary to the pacifist allegations about militant resistance, the victors did not begin oppressing one another or creating uncontrollable cycles of violence just because they had violently fought off the white invaders. They won themselves several years of freedom and peace. Their ultimate defeat does not indicate a weakness in the horizontal organization of the Lakota and Cheyenne, so much as the fact that the white American population trying to exterminate them outnumbered these indigenous groups by a thousand to one and had the ability to spread disease and drug addiction on their home turf while destroying their food source. Lakota resistance never ended, and they may win their war in the end. So, I want to get a general sense from your perspective. How do you perceive the world that you're living in? What, what kind of world is this? What's happening? Ooh. Broad strokes. Sure, sure, sure. From the perspective of a mammal, uh, it, it feels like the world is one, a place of death and suffering. Um, if I were to put myself in the perspective of a bug, I don't know if I would see it as suffering or thriving, but given that uh, just massive amounts of mammals are being killed by the industrial project and the total number is decreasing rapidly, uh, it hurts to identify with all these mammals and life and, like, love love them and, like, feel them all dying. Um, in, uh, in terms of my personal life, I find pockets here and there where I feel like I can be my full, silly, queer, beautiful self. <laughs> uh, but, like, I don't know. I feel like I have to, like, kind of hide it or stomach or swallow a lot of it to stay productive enough to survive, which I don't feel like is necessary. Um, so I see a lot of beauty, but like, damn, there's like, I'm pretty sad a lot of the time. So I'm going to read this article, which is from the blog of the Institute for Social Ecology. It is by Adam Michael Krauss, and it's called System Change or Extinction? Thoughts on the Uninhabitable Earth. Last Monday, David Wallace Wells published The Uninhabitable Earth an essay detailing worst-case climate change scenarios. It freaks a lot of people out. It is, as he writes, a portrait of our best understanding of where the planet is heading, absent aggressive action. A lot of it is very scary. Here are a few of the scariest parts. Two degrees of warming used to be considered the threshold of catastrophe. Tens of millions of climate refugees unleashed upon an unprepared world. Now two degrees is our goal, per the Paris Climate Accords, and experts give us only slim odds of hitting it. And just how fast are we warming the Earth? 252 million years ago, the release of greenhouse gases warmed the Earth and killed 97% of all life. We are currently adding carbon to the atmosphere about 10 times faster than that. And many of the effects of climate change are already upon us. In case you haven't heard, this spring has already brought an unprecedented quadruple famine to Africa and the Middle East. We have provoked nature. Forces beyond our control will soon rage all around us. Awful events are impending, inevitable, and in some cases, already happening. There is much more. A lot of it is terrifying. It is definitely worth reading if you have not. It has also been widely criticized. The headline to Daniel Aldana Cohen's critique in Jacobin declares it disaster porn. His opening sentence contends that the piece selectively fetishizes natural science and is socially and politically hopeless. Writing in Vox, David Roberts cites various tweets accusing Wallace Walls of overstating the case to make climate change so frightening that people will just become discouraged and despondent. One tweet states, Irresponsible in that it leans very hard on the extinction porn angle, and almost not at all on the but here's what we do angle. 
As Roberts writes, the theme of all these critiques is that bad, scary news doesn't help. It terrifies and paralyzes people. Aside from the confusing piece of news, to me at least, that many people find massive environmental devastation pornographic, it also ignores what Wallace Wells clearly states is his intention. He declares the piece a portrait of our best understanding of where the planet is heading absent aggressive action. Humans will do something. Our actual future will be different than the scenarios he sketches. He is showing our current trajectory if we do nothing more. Yet, even if we do something, it could still be far worse than most of us imagine. But the uninhabitable Earth has not just been criticized for ignoring all the good things people might do. It has also been criticized for ignoring all the terrible things people will do. According to Daniel Aldana Cohen, the actually realistic danger zone is a combination of too little decarbonization too late in the context of hardening inequalities of class, race, and gender. In short, eco-apartheid. Those brutal inequalities and the bullets that maintain them, not molecules of methane, are what will kill people. Wars, famine, inequality, and the selfish refusal to help others will compound and intensify the damage done by climate change. Long before death by dehydration starts killing everyone, wars over water and fights over food will take a lot of lives. According to Cohen, the real danger is a vicious right-wing minority imposing the privilege of the affluent few over everyone else. That's the real and scary and political story. Fossil fuel barons and the politicians who enable them are hell-bent on making the most money for the fewest people, i.e. themselves, in the shortest time possible. Everything else is irrelevant, and everyone else is a historical footnote. And if shit gets really bad, the rich can always retreat to palatial estates on mountaintops, sip cognac from diamond-encrusted goblets, and sleep soundly on expensive mattresses, while the rest of us deal with super viruses, famines, droughts, wars, and plagues. There are, thus, two critiques of the uninhabitable Earth. First, Wallace Wells fails to account for all the positive environmental actions we're going to take. But he also ignores the negative political actions that are bound to occur. But something is missing here. These two critiques don't go well together. It just doesn't make sense that we could make major reductions in emissions with the same old vicious right-wing minority in power. If they're still in charge and pushing wars, we're screwed. It seems obvious, but apparently bears repeating. Environmental change requires political change. Capitalism fuels environmental devastation. We will only halt environmental devastation if we dismantle capitalism. And if a vicious right-wing minority is still imposing the privilege of the affluent few over everyone else, then the doomsday scenarios Wallace Wells describes remain likely. Curbing emissions enough to ensure the survival of life on Earth will require taking power away from that vicious minority. The extractive imperialism and vast inequalities that help the rich stay rich are warming the globe and destroying our air, water, and agriculture. We cannot reduce emissions without taking their power away. Learning to inhabit a world of equals free from borders and hatred, a world of mutual aid and an economics based on everyone's survival rather than a few people's wealth, cannot be separated from the creation of an ecological society. In fact, this is a description of an ecological society. Clean air and water are just wonderful corollaries of those other things. Fossil fuels and extractive aggressive imperialism made capitalism possible. Abolishing them will make capitalism impossible and a better world attainable. If we don't manage to abolish fossil fuels and aggressive imperialism, there's an essay called The Uninhabitable Earth you ought to read just so you know what's coming. So to say that Wallace Wells should admit that models based on doing nothing more than what we are currently doing are misleading, because of course we're going to do so much more, and to also say he should account for the vicious right-wing minority that will continue demanding that everyone kill everyone else on their behalf, well, that merely muddles up the actual issues. If these assholes are still ruling the Earth, then we are almost certainly not reducing emissions. After all, why have the wealthy been waging all these wars? They want fossil fuels extracted and burned. They want control over all the resources and to remain absurdly wealthy. If we try to reduce emissions without revoking their power, we will fail miserably. If the status quo survives, we're doomed. Death to the status quo. Yeah, and do you feel like, do you feel like what you're experiencing is part of that normal while life is hard? Or do you think it's something else? Um, 
I think it's something else. I do. I don't think it's, like, normal to be expected to be this sad. Um, I feel like there's... We, we kind of all feel this sort of sadness, and it comes out in our sense of humor, which hmm. is just sort of, like, crushingly cynical and just, like, life sucks. I don't know. What is... You know, there's that famous saying that just, like, life sucks and then you die. And we're like, ha, ha, ha. But, like, I don't think it has to be that way. There... Life's a dick. When it gets hard, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, maybe it's natural in the sense of some sort of large geological time scale of extinctions and, like, life goes through a period of sadness every X hundred or thousand years and we're experiencing some natural part of that cycle. Mm. I don't think it's natural in the sense that, like, life is always at every point through history filled with this much sadness. I feel like we can feel that way because in our entire lives we... And by that, I mean people in America or, like, other industrialized countries um, have been immersed in uh, the industrial uh, capital world, which um, I think feels this way. Um, but no, I don't think this is the only way to be. I think there's... Look, I think there's actually incredible... I think, you know, if we harnessed our uh, human ingenuity uh, with, like, a bunch of compassion and, like, real vision... We could cr live in a beautiful, incredible, like, wonderful world. Uh, so, no, I don't think this level of sadness is uh, inevitable. Yeah, and I feel lots of other emotions. But I'm way sadder now than I think I was when I was, like, a little kid. Yeah. Can you... I'd really like to hear more about those emotions, if you don't mind. Um, no, no. If you could kind of delve into the nature of that sadness and then whatever else is going on... Um... I think that's something that I certainly struggle a lot with. You know, I feel a lot of <laughs> a lot of different things as well, obviously, including sadness. Um, but I feel like it's kind of taboo to talk about sadness on that level. You know, it's one thing to say, I'm sad because my significant other broke up with me. You'll mm. get a lot of support for that kind mm. of sadness. Um, but if you say I'm sad because there's boa constrictors begging for water in Indian villages mm. and it's humanity's fault that they have to do that and they're strong, beautiful, powerful creatures who should have access to water at all times, um, that can get you a real side eye. Yeah. <laughs> What I'm referencing here is a real video on YouTube that I just wanted to throw out there that it's actually a video of a man giving water from a water bottle to a cobra and not a boa constrictor, as I said in our conversation. Um, a coworker actually showed it to me because she was so impressed that the man was so brave to do this, and she's absolutely right. He is brave, and... It's an honorable thing to do, and I have a lot of respect for it, obviously. Um, but it's also incredibly depressing uh, to witness a creature like that sucking from a water bottle like it's a baby. I hate what we've done to the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, um, tell, me, tell me more about that. Sure, well, I think you've really gotten close to uh, something there, which is we're not just experiencing a deep sadness, but also uh, an isolation. Like, I I feel an isolation from humans uh, in general in the sense that, like, the things I feel like I really care about um, I feel like are not what is... Um, consciously affecting other people a lot of the time and so um yeah i feel a little trouble relating to people because i like i can feel this i can feel the mass death of wildlife wherever i am at any point in time i never really escape from it it's just part of being alive and um yeah so there's an isolation coupled with the sadness which uh, makes it harder and i remember i said something like 
Uh, I was in lab, and I'm just sort of spouting off to my lab mates. Uh, I see, I'm already kind of denigrating myself for, like, expressing myself. Hmm. Um, that I, you know, I, I said something, I think I said maybe, like, you have to, I feel like you really have to uh, tread through the depths of despair to find real hope. <laughs> <laughs> I which, totally feel that. Which is like totally something true for me and like <laughs> feels really, really real and was just like the encapsulation of just a huge amount of thoughts. And my lab mate was like, oh yeah, ha, Harry, like they're always just being really dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just want to, you know, sometimes I just want to yell, like, I'm like, no, the world is dramatic and I'm speaking as like soberly as I can about it. Yeah. I mean, it seems almost like the boy who cried wolf because, you know, people have been screaming about the end of the world for centuries, mostly religious fanatics. At any rate, um, eventually there really was a wolf and that kid got et. <laughs> kid did get eaten. Kid did get eaten. Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure that's how the story ends. Maybe somebody like came and and cut him out of the wolf's belly, like in Little Red Riding Hood. But um, either way, uh, so how do you react to the world? What is your response to this feeling? So you've already talked somewhat about it. You went to the DAPL protest. Yeah. Um, you have started this uh, STEM Strikes the War Machine. Did I say it right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, you have ways in which you're active, and uh, I'd I love, love to hear more about that. I, you have a, a really good story about standing up to a Koch brother, which... Uh, Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. One. Sure. Um, so sure, I'll start in. Um, I guess there's two main ways of doing this. One is like a compulsion to be active. Two is sometimes I like light a candle and say a prayer and just take a time to really feel it. So I don't have to feel the obligation to feel the sadness all the time. Uh, what Ketchup just referred to is. Um, uh, yeah, she actually misheard me a while back. I didn't correct her then, but I guess now's the time. It wasn't a Koch brother. It was Harold Coe, who, uh, Harold Coe was one of the lawyers for, uh, Hillary Clinton and the State Department back when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. And Harold Coe was just, like, legally Wow, I really misunderstood your story before. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Harold uh, Coe was... It was one, written in a letter, so I misread it, actually. Indeed. Uh, or perhaps I, thought I had just misspelled it, which I was a totally... Uh, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, he was a lawyer, uh, for, um, on the State Department, uh, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, and the drone program was being drafted, and they were, you know, figuring out all the ways to make it legal to assassinate someone... Uh, without any charges, and to assassinate tons of civilians, too, and just have that be, like, not a war crime. Uh, in my opinion, it is a war crime, obviously, to kill just civilians at will without any oversight. Uh, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, so, Her oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harold Coe, you know, I, I call him the legal architect of the drone program. I'm not a law professor, but uh, that's what he appears to me to have been. About Harold Coe, and that's K-O-H for anyone trying to do their own research, is Harry's assessment correct? Now, considering the steeping pile of garbage we find ourselves saddled with as president now, when it comes to Obama, I've noticed most liberals seem inclined to forgive and forget when it comes to the ugliness of drone warfare. Harold Coe worked as the legal advisor to the State Department under Obama and had previously been a staunch critic of Guantanamo Bay and torture without a trial during the Bush administration, but then helped devise and also, importantly, was a vocal defender of programs that actually killed so-called terrorists as well as civilians without trial and with unmanned drones controlled by soldiers on another continent. When Coe was appointed as a professor of human rights and international law at NYU for the 2014-2015 school year, there were protests and a statement of no confidence signed by hundreds of NYU students and faculty, as well as other groups, condemning the appointment. 
But there was also a strong pushback against this, much of the thrust of which was that Harold Coe has fought for humanitarian practices all his life, shouldn't be judged by one part of his career alone, and that actually, thanks to him, the drone program wound up less horrifying than it would have been without him. Resistors argue that if he is such a humanitarian, he ought to have resigned in protest. According to the Economist article, Fallout Reaches the Ivory Tower by KK, Mr. Coe could well have been the strongest and most effective advocate for human rights principles relating to the use of drones, and nevertheless also have been a key legal architect of a program that has done, quote, structural damage to the cornerstones of international security and set precedents that undermine the protection of life across the globe in the longer term as a UN report put it. So you decide. And uh, he was invited to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in the October of 2016. Um, so I was part of organizing a protest of that. We were outside, um, you know, slinging our slogans, making our chants, doing some interviews with the press. Slogan our slogans. Slabbing our slip-ups. And... <laughs> um, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to face him, too. I didn't just want to be outside. I wanted to go on the inside as well. So, uh, you know, maybe when the lecture was about halfway through or so, I went into the law building. I said to these secretaries, like, hey, where's this Harold Co lecture on? And they pointed me in that direction. They're like, oh, but the hall's filled. I'm like, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so I went over and I like, so I think I was at the wrong door. Something opened it. And there's just all this audio visual equipment, so I'd like step over these cables, and there's just like one seat there, which was like reserved for AV, but it was empty, so I sat in it, and nobody <laughs> told me not to. Um, Harry looks like they could totally be an AV guy, just for the record. <laughs> so very believable this guy's uh, <laughs> little goatee and stuff. Sorry, it's not a goatee, it's a small beard. It's a, uh, no, I don't, for the record, I do not shave it into a goatee shape. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. They don't. And I had a, I had a man bun on at the time. Really? Yeah, was it yeah. blonde? Uh, no, it was not okay, dyed good. blonde yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I dyed my hair blonde for Halloween that year. Uh, so this is like October 28th, <laughs> right before I dyed it blonde. <clears throat> I'm in there. I get a little side eye from the AV guy who is there, um, but whatever. And so I'm watching this lecture, and it's, it's awful. Fuck, he's just like droning on. Droning um, on. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe if I'd been in law, it would have been interesting, but God, it's so boring. Um, but I'm just like hunting for something he says that I can like latch onto and then like ask my question during the Q of A and like reference something he said instead of like coming totally out of left field, you know, because I want to appear legitimate. And um, so the lecture's over and it's like, okay, now it's time to take some questions. Uh, so, you know, my hand, I shoot my hand right up, like, I am going to be in this. I am going to, I'm going to ask my question. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and if someone else gets called on, like, that's fine. And Harold Co answers that question, person, and he just, like, talks for, like, five minutes, just rambling. And I'm like, God, Co, like, finish it up. And then it's like, okay, time for a second question. And so they go, like, tr starting to hand the microphone to someone else, and, like, some other guy says, while you're handing the microphone to that person, I'll ask a question. And this guy asked a question out of turn, and then Harold Coe answers that question too. And like, I, I think you know, if some if some white guy like asks this question out of turn, a good speaker would say like, no, I'm gonna follow a process and let the next person answer. But no, he ends up answering that question for like six or seven minutes, and then like the dean of law school is like, okay, time for one more question. And like, come on, me, 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 and then like calls on someone else. Um, and so then, you know, once again, Harold Coe embarks on his third winding, blah, blah, rambling answer. And I'm like, I'm just, I know myself, like, well, I'm not going to not ask my question. <laughs> so I wait for a little bit and, you know, I wait for five minutes. I wait till I find something that is somewhat related to what I'm going to say. And then I just like stand up and I say like, yeah, so speaking of force negotiation, at the end of your presentation, you emphasize the need for smart power over hard power and laws that make that an easier route to go. But as the legal architect of the drone assassination program, we have a situation now where America can kill 
with impunity, without trial, and without even levying charges. And so hard power is actually very, very easy to use because of laws that you designed. Doesn't that go against what you advised? And like heads turn, everyone like looks over, and I'm like, whew, we got everyone's attention. My heart's beating so fast. It's like really exciting. And um, and like uh, I lock eyes with Harold Co. And so I ask my question, and he says um, he does not answer it. Of course, he, which is to be expected, um, but it's like not a bad thing. Uh, he says like you maybe if you had your facts right, you would actually know what's going on, and I can refer you to some reading material. Um, like, all right, and all this time I'm, like, locking eyes with this war criminal, and, like, I can feel my world vibrating. It's, like, it actually feels, like, really good. I'm, like, staring into his soul. I can feel it. There's just, like, some like, real energy there. And, um, and then, so he winds up, and I'm like, well, you actually didn't answer the question. And the dean starts defending him, like, okay, well, you know, we can send you some material to read. And I'm like, no, I want to hear the uh, I want to hear it from Harold Co. And so then Harold Co. says like, oh, all right, all right. And then says like, you know, I will not apologize for what I've done. It was a hard situation, hard decision, blah, 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 blah. No answer. I want to hear it from Harold Co. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. No, no, sure. Um, I have my own. I have uh, been a little while. Everything I've done. I participated in legal exercises with colleagues. Uh, if you've done the reading, you know how many difficult experiences I went through. Um, and, uh, you know, that's my job. Uh, I do not consider myself the legal architect of anything. Uh, I consider myself someone who tries to help design a framework to control the use of force. In a setting which you can use force under some circumstances and not under others. Under the laws of war, you can legally kill some people, whether you like it or not. And you cannot legally kill other people. And it's the job of lawyers and the government to draw those lines. I drew those lines with others, and I think we drew them correctly. It's painful. It's not something that I enjoy. But I have absolutely no apologies to make about it. I think I did the best job that any human could do. Uh, and if you are lucky enough to be in the same situation, I hope you uh, give it the same uh, energy and commitment. Um, you know, it's easier to say somebody else did something wrong than to do it right yourself. I can criticize uh, baseball players for not doing their best job at the Greek field, even if I can't do what they do. But my view is if you want to be in the arena, which I did, you take the criticism, which I have done. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. It comes with the territory. But I also think that everybody has the right to express their view. If they have their facts wrong, I'm entitled to say you got your facts wrong. So anyway, well, why don't you read this stuff and you can send me and can discuss it further after you uh, Thank you. Well, let's uh, uh, extend our appreciation. Uh, all the while, I'm just making like really hard eye contact with you know a mass murderer, which is thrilling, honestly. <laughs> um, and he goes, he spouts off for another few moments, uh, and then I say thank you, and I like really hope that um, I I mean he was embarrassed, and like I really hope some of those law students were like intelligent enough to see that he didn't answer the question instead of just following what uh, is institutionally um, condoned. There had to um, be a few. I'm sure there were a few. And like, it was... And then I just felt amazing after I did it. And I'd been recording on my phone, and the AV guy next to me is like, hey, you can't record that. And I'm like, excuse me. And I go run out, and I like prop, push the door open, and I go like run through a field. Ah, oh, it feels great. <laughs> and I do have an audio recording of it, too. Nice. Yeah, nice. Which... You should send me that. Okay, I'll send that to you. Um, I mean, what I really love about that story is that you took numerous opportunities to break rules in order to accomplish what you wanted to. First, you 
sat in the seat that you weren't supposed to sit in and then you asked a question when it wasn't your turn and then you breezed by a guy who was telling you that you weren't allowed to keep that and that recording and I think that it is exceedingly difficult for most people in our rule bound society um even when even when there's no uh, clear and present consequence, we're anxious. We're very terrified mm. to break even these small, inconsequential rules mm. of um, deportment, basically. Mm. You know, uh, you weren't breaking any laws, but you were breaking rules mm. and standards. And, um, and that's what I think makes it extra great and inspiring. Because Thank you. The next couple excerpts are from We Are All Very Anxious by the Institute for Precarious Consciousness. Today's public secret is that everyone is anxious. Anxiety has spread from its previous localized locations, like sexuality, to the whole of the social field. All forms of intensity, self-expression, emotional connection, immediacy, and enjoyment are now laced with anxiety. It has become the linchpin of subordination. One major part of the social underpinning of anxiety is the multifaceted omnipresent web of surveillance. The NSA, CCTV, performance management reviews, the privileges system in the prisons, the constant examination and classification of the youngest school children. But this obvious web is only the outer carapace. We need to think about the ways in which a neoliberal idea of success inculcates these surveillance mechanisms inside the subjectivities and life stories of most of the population. We need to think about how people's deliberate and ostensibly voluntary self-exposure through social media, visible consumption, and choice of positions within the field of opinions also assumes a performance in the field of the perpetual gaze of virtual others. We need to think about the ways in which this gaze inflects how we find, measure, and know one another as co-actors in an infinitely watched perpetual performance. Our success in this performance in turn affects everything, from our ability to access human warmth to our ability to access means of subsistence, not just in the form of the wage, but also in the form of credit. Outsides to the field of mediatized surveillance are increasingly closed off, as public space is bureaucratized and privatized and a widening range of human activity is criminalized, on the grounds of risk, security, nuisance, quality of life, or antisocial behavior. In this increasingly securitized and visible field, we are commanded to communicate. The incommunicable is excluded. Since everyone is disposable, the system holds the threat of forcibly de-linking anyone at any time, in a context where alternatives are foreclosed in advance, so that forcible de-linking entails desocialization, leading to an absurd non-choice between desocialized inclusion and desocialized exclusion. This threat is manifested in small ways in today's disciplinary practices, from timeouts and internet bans to firings and benefit sanctions, culminating in the draconian forms of solitary confinement found in prisons. Such regimes are the zero degree of control by anxiety, the breakdown of all the coordinates of connectedness in a setting of constant danger in order to produce a collapse of personality. Obviously, there are lines that you cross and it's no longer so easy to get away with it. But I also think there's a lot of things we could be getting away with that we choose not to yeah. because we think we couldn't. I know I'm guilty of that, certainly out of fear and anxiety. And uh, anyway, I just think that's really fucking cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Ketchup. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's part of why I felt so like giddy after it was that like I got away with it after breaking a few rules. <laughs> During periods of mobilization and effective social change, people feel a sense of empowerment, the ability to express themselves, a sense of authenticity and de-repression or disalienation, which can act as an effective treatment for depression and psychological problems, a kind of peak experience. 
It is what sustains political activity. Such experiences have become far more rare in recent years. We might here focus on two related developments, preemption and punishment by process. Preemptive tactics are those which stop protests before they start, or before they can achieve anything. Ketiline mass arrests, stop and search, lockdowns, house raids, and preemptive arrests are examples of these kinds of tactics. Punishment by process entails keeping people in a situation of fear, pain, or vulnerability through the abuse of procedures designed for other purposes, such as keeping people on pre-charge or pre-trial bail conditions which disrupt their everyday activity, using no-fly and border stop lists to harass known dissidents, carrying out violent dawn raids, needlessly putting people's photographs in the press, arresting people on suspicion, sometimes in accord with quotes using pain compliance holds, or quietly making known that someone is under surveillance. Once fear of state interference is instilled, it is reinforced by the web of visible surveillance that is gridded across public space and which acts as strategically placed triggers of trauma and anxiety. Anecdotal evidence has provided many horror stories about the effects of such tactics. People left a nervous wreck after years awaiting a trial on charges for which they were acquitted, committing suicide after months out of touch with their friends and family, or afraid to go out after incidents of abuse. The effects are just as real as if the state was killing or disappearing people, but they are rendered largely invisible. In addition, many radicals are also on the receiving end of precarious employment and punitive benefit regimes. We are failing to escape the generalized production of anxiety. Current militant resistance does not and cannot combat anxiety. It often involves deliberate exposure to high anxiety situations. Insurrectionists overcome anxiety by turning negative affects into anger and acting on this anger through a projectile affect of attack. In many ways, this provides an alternative to anxiety. However, it is difficult for people to pass from anxiety to anger, and it is easy for people to be pushed back the other way due to trauma. We've noticed a certain tendency for insurrectionists to refuse to take seriously the existence of psychological barriers to militant action. Their response tends to be, just do it. But anxiety is a real material force. Saying just do it is like saying to someone with a broken leg, just walk. This next section is from the afterword called Cause and Affect from one study group within the Crime Think Workers Collective. When we understand capitalism as affective, as producing and being sustained by certain feelings, attitudes, and ways of relating, many things come into focus. These affects are not simply the effects of economic relations, they are essential to the relations themselves. The ostensibly material needs that drive the economy are socially produced, just as the obedience and disassociation it demands are culturally conditioned. The individualism of modern workers and consumers, our estrangement from other living things, our sense that finance is real while ecology is abstract, Above all, the ways we are accustomed to private property and authority. Without these, the market that seems so timeless and unassailable would collapse. Attempting to understand the economy by following the stock market, rather than starting from our lived experiences, is symptomatic of the same disconnect that drives capitalism in the first place. Private sentiments and personal relations are no less fundamental than material conditions. We need language with which to discuss the affective conditions. Considering capitalist relations through this lens clarifies, among other things, how protest activity that doesn't succeed in redressing the grievances it opposes can still leave its participants feeling fulfilled, sometimes more so than if the object of their immediate demands had simply been granted outright. We treasure the nights in the square together telling stories, the times we held our ground, more than the meager concessions we sometimes win. 
Until now, this phenomenon has usually been explained somewhat glibly in terms of the dignity of standing up for ourselves. But when we conceptualize our conditions under capitalism as affective, we can see why forms of resistance that transform the affective conditions could be fulfilling in and of themselves, not just as a means to fuller bellies and higher thermostats. As Occupy and other movements have shown, many would gladly eat sandy beans and sleep on bare bricks if only they could break with misery, with boredom, with anxiety. Likewise, framing the problems we face as affective can help us to avoid pursuing or accepting apparent solutions that do not change how we feel and relate. What could actually counter anxiety? Do we have to beat security guards, insurance policies, religious communities, and antidepressants at their own game, somehow making people feel safe in a hostile and hazardous world? Trying to allay anxiety as a separate project from abolishing the conditions that create it is surely doomed. Should we accept the worst case scenario as a foregone conclusion and hurry forth to meet it, transforming our anxiety into a weapon? If anxiety is the omnipresent guardian of the prevailing order, it presents the perfect point of departure for resistance. But this does not answer how those already immobilized by it could perform such alchemy. Perhaps in the course of taking on the ruling order, we could create something together that inspires confidence, grounding ourselves in a shared sense of reality that no market or military could take from us. <laughs> and like on that topic of shit we can get away with like there's so much like propaganda around our world like it just takes one person and a sharpie to deface it and like yeah. render it uh render it um useless pointless yeah useless dumb. and pointless and like called out <laughs> and you know the more um sure like like hardcore direct action is like really important obviously like you know locking down to police stations but also, like, a massive amount of people doing little direct action of, like, graffiti and just consistently defacing, like, shitty propaganda is also, like, that would be powerful, too. That would be yeah, super powerful. I agree. Um, and then I just wanted to mention, speaking of propaganda and what I thought was going to be a story about a Koch brother, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I it just reminded me... Because I know that after you sent me that story, I wrote you back about my dad's interaction with one of the Koch brothers because I thought it was relevant, which it wasn't. Um, <laughs> but, it <does. laughs> but it does remind me. Um, so just, again, on the topic of propaganda, um, my father was recently invited to and attended Bohemian Grove. Are you familiar with Bohemian mm, what Grove? What is Bohemian Grove? Um, <laughs> thank you, Dad. Um, so just briefly, um, tell me a little bit about your visit to Bohemian Grove, what that is, and uh, how you ended up meeting Charles Koch. Okay. Well, that was one of these things where, you know, it, it, it was kind of a, a few days of preconceptions, you know, being challenged. And when I first got invited by a good, good friend to go to Bohemian Grove, I thought, wait a minute, whatever I've heard about this, I didn't like. It sounded all Illuminati and uh, things like that. It just sounded, you know, shrouds and secret handshakes and stuff. And I go, I just can't imagine, but... My friend is my friend, and they are a kind, generous person, and so I'll go. And I got there, and I loved it. It was food, and it was hiking, and it was lectures, and everybody was just very other-directed. You know, everybody wanted to talk about you and how you felt, and, and uh, you got on the same page with people really quickly, and it was just, yeah. it was interesting, very interesting. Uh, so I had to redial what I thought I knew, but you know what? When you're when you're doing something, and you're going against what you've heard, and then you've got reality. You know, reality's going to win. So that was a good thing. But I could have let what I thought I knew that could have kept me from going, and that would have been a shame. You know. So lesson learned. Okay. So among all the different lectures they had. One, uh, it was about the first day I was there, it was going to be breakfast with Charles Koch at the camp next to our camp. And I thought, 
Oh my God. Cause I had, all I knew was surely he was Satan and he had horns and fire came out of his mouth and I didn't want to be around that person. And, but then just before I got there on, in USA Today on the plane going out, there was a front page article about how much Charles Koch didn't really have the time of day for Trump, who was just about the candidate at that point. And I thought, oh, what, what about that? enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing. And I thought, okay. So I started questioning whether he was my enemy or my friend. Be- well, you see how that's going. Anyway, so I said, you know what? I'm going. So I went. And it was just a little breakfast thing. And there was, I doubt if there was even 100 people there. It was probably like 50 people. And, uh, yeah. And so I imagine my confusion when Instead of Satan, there's this kind of, I don't know, Jimmy Stewart-looking guy, uh, you know, 70, 80 years old, I don't know, just kind of shuffles up to the microphone. He's very fit. You know, he's, he's slender and, you know, wearing a ball hat and a polar fleece vest. You would not have noticed him at all anywhere. He isn't flashy. He can, and, uh, and he just started talking, and I was like, oh, my God, he talks like kind of cross between up with people and, you know, like the anarchist handbook or something. He doesn't, he doesn't like government and, and he isn't shy about it, but he's really polite and soft spoken. And, uh, and all he talks about is how he doesn't want any project unless it's good for the earth, unless it's good for his employees and everybody's safe and there's no pollution. And I'm going, well, maybe he's Santa Claus. Well, he's definitely Jimmy Stewart, and it's a beautiful life, you know, a wonderful life, I guess. And I thought, oh I said, this is so confusing. I, you know, this is diametrically, this, what I'm looking at, a few feet away, what I'm looking at is an old guy talking about how henpecked he is by his wife, and and he's he's sitting at a table full of musicians with long hair and earrings and stuff, and they're high-fiving him and stuff, and I'm going, huh. Very interesting, not what I expected at all. And part of the, and I'm thinking, why would he go to the trouble of coming here and talking to 50 people? He's surely got other billionaire things to do today. And the only thing that I is could, a billionaire thing to do. But go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what I mean. I mean, I'm thinking Scrooge McDuck in the tower full of money and he's bathing in it or something. <laughs> and the only thing I could come up with was he, he would. Re- refer to his uh, book several times, which is called Good Prophet. And I'm sure, I don't remember how it's spelled, but I'm sure he means I am a prophet, you know, as well as money prophet, you know. So it's a, and I, like I say, I forget which way it's spelled. But anyway, um, he referred to that several times. And I go, okay, even if he sells a couple books being here, I don't get it. But so what? Uh, but that leads me to the next part. I didn't talk to him. I did talk to his son, who was just as earnest and just as, you know, polo shirt and, you know, redheaded, you know, 40 year old, awful nice guy. And he talks about how his dad really made him toe the line and how he, the son, had uh, employees that made more than he did, that makes. The employees that make more than he does. And he goes, Dad, what's up with that? And Dad said, well, I told you what the rules were. You meet the goals, you get the money. He says, your employees were meeting the goals better than you. And he goes, yeah, I get it, Dad. Okay. But they were just funny and fun and, and teasy. And they just didn't act like what I thought they would act like. So I came out of this very confused. I go, that is not what I expected. And because of that, I said, why don't I pretend like I'm a good journalist, which I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm retired, but, you know, theoretically, a good journalist should be objective and neutral and just tell you the facts, right? I mean, wouldn't that be one of the goals of a good free press is just you could go someplace and trust that what you read was possibly a fact. Anyway. I mean, it sounds like science fiction, but hey. Of course, of course. I, okay, I, I, you know, I'll give you all of that. But anyway, so I said, I've been wrong on my first impression with this camp. I've been wrong on my first impression of this person. 
So I'm going to do due diligence. I'm going to do two things. I'm going to uh, get his book. I'm going to get Charles Koch's book. And he insists that everybody in his company has the book and is conversant on it, you know, and uh, okay, which, is, which is interesting. And I think it has to give you some insight into the person. I don't know. If he makes his employees mm. read it and it's their handbook, uh, then he right. must sort of mean it. Anyway, so I said, I'm going to read that book. And, I, and so I, I told a friend from Colorado uh, about this and, and that I was going to get the book. And he goes, oh, my God. He says, you have to read the story uh, Dark Money by Jane Mayer of the New York New York Times or New Yorker, I think, maybe one of those two. And uh, anyway, because he said, that'll give you the opposite. You know, and I said, okay, so I did that. And oh my gosh, you read Jane Mayer's book, and yep, he is Satan. I mean, <laughs> he's, every, he's everything that, you know, he's, that's bad, you know. They do all kinds of clandestine things where they fund one innocent sounding group and then it funds another group and it funds another group and it funds another group and the next thing you know it's you know lobbying for you know drilling in schoolyards or something i have no you know just everything you know money making money grubbing and yeah. and then so i read that book and i said oh my gosh we're back to satan and i read his book and i go no we're back to santa claus and you know what I never got resolved on the whole thing. When I was talking about the camp. I had an impression. I went. It was wrong. I corrected my impression. Okay? Yeah. This was the most confusing thing. This person is the most lovable, friendly, affable, self-deprecating Midwestern. He's like from Kansas or something. He's something from mm -hmm. the dead Midwest, no accent. And... Um, he just presents really, really, really amazingly well. I mean, you want to like him. When you're there, you want to like him. And then you read Jane Mayer's book, and you go, oh, my God, shoot on sight. I mean, it's just, I mean, yeah. just terrible. And, and so I never did get resolved. I really, I, I did due diligence, and I felt good about that. I felt good that I had not just, because it's pretty easy to be out there in life and go, well, this is what I think. I think I'm a Democrat. I think I'm a Libertarian. I think I'm... And then you only read things that reinforce that, you know, you're preaching to the choir, that kind of thing. And yeah. really, that doesn't do anybody any good sometimes. I mean, you know, you realize that. You, you realize that you are kind of driving the bus and you're causing your reaction or your opinions to be reinforced and you're not open to the other side. And I said... For once in my life, I'm going to be really open to it. And what good did it do me? Uh, nothing. I could not, based on the, based on the uh, information I had at hand, I couldn't get there. One time, this is kind of a side bounce, but one time, or two times actually, I was on jury duty, and it was really taxing because one of the things that became crystal clear to me was in spite of the part where you raise your hand and do you solemnly tell the truth, the whole truth, and all the laws about perjury and everything, guess what? Everybody lies on both sides. I have sat in the jury rooms and gone, well, listen to that. Of course they're right. And then the other side gets up, you go, oh, I've been misled. They're perfectly wrong. And, uh, yeah. and so you just come out going, I guess I just have to be God and make my decision and you know, there you go. But I found it very distressing to be in that position. And I've never been in a position where uh, I did all my research and then I really couldn't decide who was lying less, you know, so. Well, and I don't mean to distress you, but, you know, you're you're put on the jury. Does, does Charles Koch go to heaven or hell, you know? <laughs> I, you have it's up to Stu. You are God. What do you what do you think would be your answer? I think it'd be the bad place, in spite of how charming he is. And I was very surprised at that because if I was his PR guy, I would say you get your 
charming Midwestern self on TV 24 hours a day because, <laughs> you know, you would change people's mind. The trick is that I kind of believe Jane Mayer more. She, the only act she's got to grind is if she's sensational enough, people will read her and they'll flock to see what her opinion is and etc. cetera. Uh, and, but in general, she's got chapter and verse and footnotes and dates and times and documents to pieces. And the other one, is uh, uh, Charles Koch's own voice of how he would like to be seen. You know, so, uh-huh. you know, I mean, he's got a vested interest. I mean, he sees himself as a kind, gentle person looking out for the little guy. And I think that is so interesting because I, I've never seen anything as in conflict as those two portraits of the same person. Fascinating. I thought so. I thought, uh, yeah. And, and and it's interesting because he surely must know what his persona is to a, to a really lot of people. Yeah. Oh, and not to mention this part, he's not just a blowhard about, um, uh, you know, we have politicians who hardly could get out of school and, uh, and that just whatever thing strikes their fancy, they just open their mouth and say stuff, you know. And uh, uh, this guy's got three engineering PhDs, like nuclear physics, oh. chemistry, engineering. I mean, for, oh, they're all from MIT. Okay. So he was oh. born rich, educated to death. And, I mean, he's not dumb. But then, oh, what's the guy, the, the head of Syria, you know, the, I mean, he's, he's like a medical doctor or an eye doctor or something. You know, so you, so just, but I'm just saying that's just for context. And yeah. uh, I guess if you had made me do the short answer, I would go with where I started, reinforced by Jane Mayer's book, which was, like I say, just documented to death. Yeah. I mean, I'm allowing for her to have it. She's grinding a liberal edge. Okay, you you know that. I mean, she's you know you just have to accept that. I mean, you don't read the New Yorker and not expect to have a little liberal leanings. But but this is her book, and it's just all facts and figures. Yeah. Well, and I think what you're saying about their intelligence, more than anything, speaks to the likelihood of them being able to craft a sophisticated lie about what they do and what they think. I just can't, I just can't get my arms around what their absolute end game is is in the sense that you know if i was just like fabulously rich i just don't know if i mean it feels like it's for control you know like you want to be a controlling kind of person and you want to have your opinion uh be the opinion but i just wish they could get a we've got all the money in the world let's go to monte carlo Let's get a new yacht. Let's just like uh, rain money down on the poor folks by hiring them to be our, you know, crew and things like that. I don't know. It sounds better than what they do choose to use it for. So I'm I'm all for that. If they want to go to Monte Carlo and stop destroying the world, uh, more power to them, I guess. But otherwise, less power to them. <laughs> I would highly recommend reading both these books. I just think they're both quite... I don't, I don't see how you could get further afield as far as uh, portraits being painted of the same person. I just yeah. don't know if anybody has been <laughs> uh, painted both ways to this extreme. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Probably. Oh, probably, uh, yeah. But it's very interesting. Yeah. So. Um, okay. okay. Well, I think that about covers it. Thank you so much, Dad, for your perspective on this. Um, I find it really fascinating. So, uh, anything, anything else you wanted to add? Didn't resolve anything. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. But, but we sort of got a, a qualified bad place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for asking. All right. All right. Have a great day, guys. Thanks. Bye. Uh, So Bohemian Grove is a, um, 
it is a getaway for very rich and important men and artists, all male, exclusively male, huh. um, to just like get together and hang out. And uh, my dad was invited by a a person who recently became a member, and uh, and he went. And the Koch brothers are regulars there, very entrenched members. And my mm. dad got to have a um, sort of meet and greet with Charles Koch. I believe it was Charles. Whoa. Um, and Charles Koch also did a talk for some of the members. And they're not allowed to have phones. They can't take pictures or record mm. anything. But my dad did do sketches, which maybe I could get some of those. But at any rate, um, it was fascinating because right after getting out of the conference, he wrote me, my dad wrote me, and said that Charles Koch talks just like me. That he <laughs> talks like a utopian socialist anarchist. And that Whoa. everything is about, you know, how people are going to be free and happy and everything that he's doing is for everyone's good and, and, the, and the sake of the betterment of humanity. And, um, and then my dad went and he read, I believe the book is, book is called Dark Water or Dark Money or Black yeah. Water or Black Money. <laughs> uh, it's one of those titles. Anyway, he read this book well, about the... Blackwater is a private militia, so maybe it wasn't that one. Probably not that one. Okay, let's cross that one <laughs> off the list. Uh, I want to say Dark Water. That's the first one I said and that's the one I'm inclined towards. So, um, <laughs> anyway, then my dad read... And, went and read a book about the Koch brothers and was like, oh, they're devils incarnate. You know, my dad is not yeah. conservative uh, at all and does not have that sense of the world. But it was amazing how someone like my dad, who was inclined against these people, yeah. could... I mean, he really was taken in by how basically charming yeah. this dude was and how much he... You know, you can say, I want everyone to be happy a million different ways, and yeah. it sounds really good, and then go and do the opposite behind closed doors. And that's what a lot of these people, I think Harold Coe included, are trying to do. They'll say one thing and do another, and I just think that's very important to remember. Yeah, and also I believe that um, there is, you know, I don't think they are perfectly, like know how awful they are. I believe there's strong parts within them as well that are, like, terrible, hyper-rich, hyper-powerful elites who do believe, like, they're working for a utopia have, uh, through, you know, you can rationalize just about anything, especially when you only interact with people of your, uh, who are also, like, hyper-rich and hyper-elite like you. Um, so, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of lying to the self that I think probably Agreed. happens Agreed. with those people. Yeah. But also, I think that being that rich uh, really messes with your head, and <laughs> there's just no real way to relate to the struggles of regular people anymore. Not that I'm not making any excuses for them, yeah. but I think there's a lot of delusion happening sure, just sure. based on lack of information at a certain point. Sure, and um, I'll also make just about the same point you yeah. just made, which is, um, yeah, I mean... Even if they are deluded and do to some degree believe they're doing the right thing, that's no excuse to, like, not oppose them as hard as we can. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yes. Yeah, fuck the Koch brothers. Um, <laughs> fuck those guys. Yeah. I, let's stop them. Stop them! When I think just, like, the real process, like, the good process is just sort of this messy one in which we, like, have all this empathy for everybody and like love like i really do love every organism in this universe and just going through the messy process of reconciling that with the fact that like some people we like have to just fuck their shit up even though it'll mm -hmm. hurt them like you know love your enemy fight them anyway yeah. uh, that's my motto i like that love your enemy Thank you. fight them anyway thank you and i want to make one point about anger and this is something i've been learning recently like Anger is actually really, really useful. Um, uh, and here's how it's been useful for me personally is that is uh, I've used it in the process of reconciling my love for every organism with my understanding that there's people I have to oppose. 
because like I'm coming to realize I'm not some like incredible spiritual being who can just like when someone tries to manipulate or lie to me hurt me or just be like I understand that they are coming from a place of hurt like I you know sometimes like I, I can't just hold in, inside my entire head like why their argument's wrong and how exactly it just comes from their shitty stuff I have to like in order to like fend off all that manipulation like I have to get angry like people try to like manipulate me and like insult me or like dismiss my beliefs or stuff like I get angry on side and I let that anger course through me so that like I won't just like submit to their like psychological people are throwing psychological shit around mm -hmm. everywhere there's so much shame being thrown around especially at activists mm -hmm. and like I'm not such an advanced spiritual being that I can say like all that shame they're throwing at me as an activist is just an expression of their own inner darkness like I will continue on with love for them love for myself uh, I try to be as much as I, that way as I can, uh, but, like, no, like, so, like, some people are being, like, bad and shitty to me and, like, just trying to put me down, like, to assuage their own guilt, and, like, that's wrong, and I'm angry at them, and, like, just on the inside of, like, my psychological body, like, sometimes the only way I cannot, like, let that shame travel further inward and, like, stop me is to, like, push back against it with anger, it's like this way to psychologically push back against those who like try to shame you and put you down. It's to like use the anger for that purpose. <sighs> and it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for listening to Melon Heart. I'm your host, Ketchup Freeland, and my guest today was Harry Mikolaid. All the music you heard was by Bolshevik Rave Party. Check out more from them on SoundCloud. The songs you heard were Chippy Rave Girl, Sup Ho, A New Challenger, Bad Dreams, Could Be Dangerous, The Weather Man, I Can, and Happy. My intro also featured a clip from the cartoon Adventure Time and another from The X Worker, a brilliant anarchist podcast you should definitely check out. The clip is from a great recent episode called Not Your Grandparents Anti Fascism. I'm hoping to get the next episode of Melon Heart out in a month, but who knows? So if you liked this, please subscribe. And now a clip of Dan Harmon on the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. Right? Yeah. Anarchy is 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 what I always recreationally was like, that's the only thing that works. It's like lack of hierarchy, decentralization. There's a million types of anarchy. Like every, every everything we've been fed about the word anarchy from the get-go yeah. is bullshit. Yep. Like people, it's a synonym for chaos in, yeah. in the fucking thesaurus. And, it, and it, that's because it's the scariest thing that power has ever that's right. um, encountered yeah. because anarchy has worked in spots you know around the earth like like and every time it does work uh tanks roll in and crush it and try to wipe it from the history books and yeah. wipe it off the map because it's a fucking threat it's the idea that humankind is born free doesn't need to yeah. be told what to do by another human being and yet still cannot kill doesn't need to i like like can work with yeah. his fellow man and like create communities there's nothing about anarchy that says there needs to be chaos that's it, it it's like spontaneous perfect human communal order that we are designed to have biologically and intellectually and, you know yes like,